Good morning, everyone. I'm Kimberly Achalia with PHCA. Thanks so much for joining us for today's webinar. A few quick updates to share before we get started. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the PHCA website. The webinar has been approved for one continuing education credit for all PHCA members in attendance. For those who provided a NAB number, credits will be uploaded within the next two to three weeks. As we begin today, all attendees should be in listen-only mode. Please feel free to submit your questions using the chat icon at the bottom of your screen, and we'll make sure to answer as many of those questions as possible at the end of today's presentation. And now I'll turn it over. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good morning, and uh, thanks for being here. Uh, hopefully, uh, everybody wants to be at the guardianship for SNF residents in 24 and beyond what providers really, and I put in parentheses really, because I I try to focus, you know, on, on what's in, important in, in my estimation in this seminar, but really need to know. A little bit about me. Uh, I'm a lawyer. I've been a lawyer since 2000, uh, the year 2000. Before, I've been a licensed nursing home administrator since uh, 1993, I believe. And I worked as an administrator for a bunch of years. Then I went to law school at night while I continued to work. And after I became uh, an attorney, I left the uh, the field and, and I've been doing this now for oh, 24 years. I started in nursing homes back in the late 80s. So altogether, hard to believe I've got about 35 years of experience working in the uh, long-term care industry. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a little bit of a, an overview so that everybody can kind of, for those of you who are familiar with guardianships and um, have have participated or, or uh, you know, been involved in them in the past, give a little bit of information as a, as a recap. And for those of you who may not be so experienced in it, It'll be a good primer for you to get some some basic information, and then we'll move through um, the meat of what I'd like to talk about, which is going to be the uh, the recent changes that were just uh, recently enacted. So, SNFs are in business, obviously, to provide care and to be paid for services provided. And you know, I don't know what our audience mix is here. Hopefully, we have a, a wide range of people who are involved in finance, care, uh, management. But uh, as everyone knows, it's a very complex, complex business. Um, Title 20 of the Pennsylvania statutes, it's called the PEF code, probate, estates, and fiduciaries. That's what, that's what uh, governs powers of attorney and guardians. And I want to I want to just talk a little bit about the differences because I think it's important to understand um, why you you want to go for a guardian and why you might want to go for a power of attorney, and this is particularly important with some of the new changes that have just come come down in in what what we'll talk about um, uh, with the act that was just was recently. Um, uh, brought into uh, brought into uh, play by the legislature, but a power of attorney can be revoked. The biggest difference between the, the the power of attorney and a guardian is that the person has to have capacity to understand what I would call the gravity of what they're doing. I mean, they're, they, when you when you give somebody a power of attorney, you're essentially giving them the right to make decisions for you. Um, and so it's very important that when a decision is being made, and many times it's very important that you look at how capable is the person, the resident, because if, if the resident is not really capable of understanding what they're signing and they do a power of attorney, it can be challenged. Now, it is a, it is a preference of the courts because it's, it's less restrictive and it's the, the person's choice to grant a power of attorney, whereas if it's a guardian, it's it's really not by choice. Um, but but the PEF code ha has a whole, if you ever go and type in, you know, PEF code or 
or 20, uh, chapter 56 of Title 20, you can read the statute. And, and it, it's it's pretty, uh, it's it's a lot more uh, verbose and complicated than, than what I have here. But suffice it to say that if, if a person is, is with it and, and can understand what they're doing and, and has the opportunity to, to give power of attorney to someone, that's 90% of the time or more going to be the preference and the court is going to want to, to uh, do an analysis to see if, if a person has a power of attorney and if they don't, why don't they? And if they're, if they're going for guardianship, why are we doing that instead of the uh, power of attorney? When, when you hear about a durable power of attorney, and I have here presumed durable, basically what it means is if the person signs a power of attorney and they later on become incapable or you know, have some health issue that, that renders them unconscious, the power of attorney doesn't, does not go away. It stays in place unless there's specific language in it that says it's limited or for some, some uh, you know, limited duration. A guardian, on the other hand, is appointed by the, by the court and the resident, there, there has to be a finding of incapacity. So you go to court, you get a doctor to say, yes, I, I think this person is incapacitated. I don't think they can understand. I don't think that they uh, have, there's a better alternative. And it's definitely more restrictive because you're taking someone's rights away pretty much involuntarily. You can also use it to revoke a power of attorney. There are times where we have powers of attorney that are just not doing their job as a POA or sometimes even taking advantage of the person for which they've been appointed power of attorney. So uh, when you're looking at doing a guardianship, it's, it's, it's a lot more complicated process. Uh, and it's because it's for the protection, basically, of, of the alleged incapacitated person. Uh, the, the two main issues when you talk about guardians is guardian of the person, and that's things like medical affairs, where they live, who their doctor is, and guardian of the estate, which handles their financial matters, or it can be both. Um, and so... Uh, when you go to court, one of the things that you have to talk about is, you know, what kind of guardian are we looking for? Guardian of the person, guardian of the estate, uh, guardian, uh, an emergency guardianship. Courts are not real anxious to grant those. If it's a real, real life or death emergency, you can get them, but it's only supposed to last a very limited time. And then they right away schedule another hearing to go back to see whether we need to have a permanent guardianship, uh, a partial, which is just to say, well, it's only going to apply to certain things, or plenary, which is basically means that it's it's the whole. It's you're in charge. It's putting someone in charge of everything on behalf of the person who is called the alleged incapacitated person. Um, much more restrictive. The court is is, and that's one of the things that we're going to talk about with the new, the new rules. Is that's that's one of the real main reasons for the new rules that we have, um, or that or that have just been put into place with the new act. If a resident's incapacitated doesn't have a power of attorney, uh, especially in a nursing home, guardianship might be the only and the best option. In the community, it could be different, but in a nursing home, you know, when someone's in a facility, a lot of times there, there aren't a lot of real good options. Um, and as many of you know, when someone ends up in a facility, sometimes the family is kind of checked out, no longer really um, uh, wanting a lot to do with the resident sometimes. Um, sometimes the resident doesn't have a lot of friends or close family around. They're in other states. Um, and so, you know, there are times where, especially in a facility, there just might not be a lot of really good options when someone is incapacitated and not able to make their own decisions and has not previously uh, granted someone of a power of attorney. Um, this is a little bit about incapacity, ability to receive and evaluate information, 
is, is impaired to such an, a significant extent that they're partially or totally unable to manage financial resources or meet essential requirements for physical self safety. They talk different times, the, the judges will talk about ability to resist scams. Um, and it's a lot of times, you know, is this person, sometimes people are able to say, yes, I, I, I want that or no, I don't want that. Uh, or yes, I like meatloaf and no, I don't like peas. But from many times when you get beyond those simple things, those simple yes, no, basic questions, that's where the, the, the impairment comes in. And even in cases where a person is, is able to, you know, give some basic yes or no answers, Many times, you know, you find out that the impairment is such that they really need to have a guardian because if they have to make some medical decision or complex decision about their care, whether they need a surgery or a, a feeding tube or something, many times they're just not mentally at the, at the place where they're able to make those kinds of more complicated decisions. Medical evidence is generally critical most of the time. The, the court will want the, the, you're, you're at the very least you're going to have an expert report that they're going to fill out and sign which talks about diagnoses the your medications what what the likelihood is that they're going to get better which unfortunately when we're in a guardianship situation the answer is generally they're not going to get better it happens uh, but not the vast majority of the time Sometimes we do uh, psych evals. Uh, the doctor may sometimes ask to have somebody come in who does like geriatric uh, psych, and now we'll either have them fill out the report or we'll get a supplemental report. And the um, the link here takes you to the uh, the expert report that that the courts like to see uh, attached to the uh, petition. Um, I, as I said here, the medical expert could be a psychologist, medical director, attending physician, psychiatrist. It could be a combination of the two. I've often had uh, uh, hearings where I have a physician and someone who's either a psychologist or a psychiatrist uh, join and, and provide supplemental or, you know, a different, a, a, an additional opinion beyond just the medical doctor. And sometimes the medical doctor uh, or DO, the medical, uh, the attending physician wants something like that because they don't feel, you know, they're, they're a doctor, but they don't necessarily feel that they are an expert on, you know, mental capacity. And there are people out there, that's all they do. And many times it's helpful to have that. And then you know, I'm sure you've always seen, many of you have seen the BIMS or the, the mini mental. Um, <clears throat> oftentimes when I get the doctor's reports, those are uh, attached for uh, reference by the court. Um, the med to, to, to do a guardianship, basic procedure is this. You get medical evidence, file a petition, you have a proposed guardian. Sometimes it's a family member. Sometimes it's a professional guardian. Uh, and there are many of those out there across the state guardianship organizations. You have a, a, a hearing that's set. You have to give 20 days uh, notice to the person of the uh, preliminary decree. So it's generally, you know, by the time you get all your documents submitted, and get a hearing, you're, you're probably looking at two months, but if you if you have an emergency, you can get it uh, a lot quicker. You have to provide notice to next of kin, interested parties, people who like daughters, sons, brothers, sisters, people who might take, um, you know, under a, uh, under a, an estate if, if someone dies. And then you typically will have witnesses. Um, many times, not always, the judge doesn't always require uh, a doctor, especially if everybody is in agreement that the person is incapacitated, including 
the incapacitated attorney. But then they'll want to hear oftentimes from the proposed guardian, from someone at the facility who's many times either a social worker or someone in the business office or both. And you put on your, your testimony and your, your, um, your evidence, including your, your medical uh, report. And then the judge has to make a decision. Uh, yes, this person is incapacitated. No, they're not, or they're partially so. Then a decree gets issued. So here are the changes that are effective. This stuff, there's been a lot of things that are kind of not necessarily new. For example, uh, mandatory legal representation. Many times up until now, and every county, which is another thing that makes it a little bit complicated to do these, Every county has different procedures. Some counties, when you file, you get an order and they, they would automatically appoint a legal counsel to represent the resident or the alleged incapacitated. If they didn't, they would say in a, in a preliminary decree that they would want me as the filing attorney to let them know within set, you know, at least seven days before the hearing whether there is someone, whether I believe that legal counsel needs to be appointed. Most times I would only say that if there was a, uh, a challenge, if there were people, family members fighting over who should be the primary guardian, or if the resident was opposing, saying, oh, no, I don't need a guardian. Now, with the changes in Act 61, it's mandatory. And if anybody wants to read the act, you just have to really go in and type in the search engine, Pennsylvania Act 61 of 2023. And you'll see, um, you know, Title 20 amended uh, that talks about Section 55 and, and, and guardianships and petition and hearing and all of the things that we're looking at here today. There are four main uh, new things that were put in uh, affecting guardians by Act 61. This is the first. Now, if someone has their own attorney, that when I say first, I mean the first change, the mandatory legal representation. They can have their own attorney. If they don't have one, the court will appoint one. Um, if the, when you're filing the petition, if they already have a, a lawyer uh, or the family has a lawyer, you need to put that in the um, petition. And it has to be what they call qualified counsel. Now, part of the problem with this is there are still some rules that are supposed to be drafted by the Supreme Court. And they haven't done it yet. So some of the definitions and some of the things that um, uh, that that are applicable here are still being fleshed out. But one thing that is for sure must be uh, a, a legal representation for the alleged incapacitated. The lawyer must file certification who was representing the person, time and place of the meeting with the alleged incapacitated. Um, they, they're expected to, uh, you know, oh, let me go back to that. You know, the court wants to know that the lawyer has actually met with the person. They're not just getting, uh, you know, appointed to represent them. They want to know that they actually met with the person. They're, they're, they're expected to advocate for, and this is, this is a biggie, because there are times where we have had cases where, the resident absolutely says, I don't need a guardian. I don't want a guardian. And so the lawyer who's appointed for them is supposed to advocate to the extent possible uh, for that position. Now, the extent possible language gives a nice out because there are times where it's pretty obvious, uh, you know, the resident thinks they don't need a guardian. Well, the facility thinks they do. 
the nurses, the business office, the social worker, the attending physician, the person who does a psych exam, uh, and the court-appointed counsel all say eh, this person is not with it and needs a guardian. That's Those are the more, I don't want to say simple, but they're not as difficult. When, when you have someone where it's borderline, where there's a question, you know, that's where that's going to make this change to the law is going to make things a little bit more difficult because now the judge has to take this stuff into account and put it in their order that, you know, even though the AIP's expressed wishes were no guardian, don't need a guardian, and they're appointing one anyway, they have to explain why. Uh, extending through all stages of the proceedings, including review hearings. So once this lawyer gets appointed, they're with this person as their lawyer uh, until someone discharges them or they're replaced. If a guardian ad litem is deemed necessary, uh, a second attorney may be appointed. And what that means is a guardian ad litem just essentially means somebody who's appointed to act in, and look out for the best interests of the AIP as opposed, uh, at the, at, at, and that's alleged incapacitated person, as opposed to a lawyer who's appointed to represent the person who's expected to actually, to the extent possible, advocate for their expressed wishes. So you have somebody who's there to look out for their best interest versus somebody who's there to advocate. So there is a difference. It's a little bit nuanced and technical, but there's definitely a difference between appointed counsel for the AIP and simply a guardian ad litem. And a lot of times I think what you're going to see maybe when there's a guardian ad litem is a situation where I talked about where you have someone who's adamant that they don't need a guardian uh, and the, the court appointed counsel, you know, is kind of in a position where they have to advocate for those wishes. But then you have a, a second lawyer saying, well, that may be, but in the best interest of this person, not necessarily having to advocate for their expressed wishes. I think that I think that what is in their best interest is clearly that they'd have a guardian. So hopefully that gives you a flavor of kind of what the difference is between the two. <clears throat> the second chain, major change, uh, effective June 1 with Act 61, was a greater emphasis on exploration of least restrictive measures. Now, again, that's always been a part of it. And it's it was always, you know, there was even, there's even a part on the uh, physician form that you'll see that says, you know, do you think there's any less restrictive alternative to a guardian? Uh, so it's always kind of been there, but now what we're doing is the court has to make spe specific findings of fact. And some of this is, is I, I think, going to create some problems and make things a little bit more difficult than it needs to be. But the, pro the, 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 real, uh, the uh, reality is that there have been some abuses across the, the state and, in fact, the country of people being uh, appointed guardians and then taking advantage of people, taking their money, using it for their own personal uh, purposes. So this, this, um, these changes are meant meant to make make it more difficult and make everybody do a deeper dive in looking at, for example, do it would advanced directives suffice? Are there advanced directives? that would suffice, that would that would negate the need for a guardian or, or living well, which is, you know, often the same thing. Is there a power of attorney? You know, the problem that you could have there is if you have two folks and, and the wife makes the husband power of attorney or vice versa, and the person not in the facility passes away or becomes incapacitated themselves, um, then you really don't have, a, I mean, you have a power of attorney, but you don't have someone who can realistically act in the role of power of attorney. So you can say, well, is there a power of attorney? Is the person able? I just had one recently where I said, talk to the doctor. Does this person have 
the ability to sign a power of attorney. Yeah, they won't let their family be involved. Would they let an independent power of attorney be involved? And, and the person said they would. They would let somebody non-family independent. So that's that's one of the things the court's going to look at is, is that an option? Uh, or if there is a power of attorney, you know, why why will it no longer suffice? And then, of course, trusts. You know, are there trusts? Could there be a trust? I've done special needs trusts for people with who have, you know, mental deficiencies, retardation, Down syndrome. So you have to look at it and say, would would a trust suffice? Would someone who is, you know, maybe power of attorney or put in charge of a trust as trustee, would that <clears throat> would that uh, do the trick rather than necessarily needing to go to the to, to the extent of guardianship? Would a representative payee do the trick? I know in nursing homes, based of most people or many people, at least you already have rep payee for. So that may not really even be a consideration. Um, you know, a lot of times it comes down to, is there anybody to help with the Medicaid application process? And many times a representative payee is not going to have the authority to get the documentation needed uh, to get someone approved for Medicaid. So uh, maybe that would be a viable alternative and maybe it wouldn't. But those are the things you're supposed to consider <clears throat> Or the courts are to consider before they uh, they they issue an order appointing a guardian. Then after that, is is limited guardian appropriate? For example, uh, is some should it just be guardian of the person? Just be guardian of the estate? Just be guardian uh, limited to certain decisions uh, and not others? Um, yeah, you know, it's something you have to look at, or of limited duration. Is it something where you know you may you may only need a guardianship for you know a, a period of time, where you have someone who may be unconscious. You know how they they put people into like uh, medicated uh, induced medical induced comas and things like that. So they may they may issue a guardianship that says only to the extent that they're in the medically induced coma and. Once they come out of that, if they if they're once again able to make decisions, the guardianship, you know, would either be terminated or you could have uh, a review hearing. But when they when they order issue an order granting plenary guardian, an order full, in, in other words, full guardian, this this is why it's uh, it's important because once that's entered, the the person who becomes guardian uh, assumes. If, the, if it's a full or plenary guardian of the person and the estate, it essentially grants complete decision-making authority to that poor person who is appointed guardian. So just to review quick, the first thing is you're going to have mandatory legal representation. Second, there's a greater emphasis on making sure that you've, you've explored all less restrictive measures, and then the court has to put in their findings that they did and, and why those are not available or, or they're not the best, um, the best alternative. The third thing that we have, and this is one that I think is, uh, is a little tricky, uh, mandatory certification. Uh, I know that there have been times where we've had a heck of a time finding someone to, to act as guardian for people in certain parts of the state, rural areas, um, and certain other areas that uh, it's, it's it's not always just easy to find somebody to, to be guardian. And now with the, the changes in Act 61, you need to have a mandatory certification. Now, some places uh, that, that I deal with have already been doing that, or at least having certain of the guardians who work for them get a certification. Um, but again, this is another one of those rules that's being written by the Supreme Court where we don't have complete clarity. What we do know that if anybody is going to act as a guardian for more than two people, they have to have certification or at least arguably to be determined somebody in an or organization who has a certification. 
but they can waive the requirement if they have an equivalent license or certification to ensure they can meet obligations. So maybe if you're a lawyer, maybe if you're a master of social work, maybe if you're a nursing home administrator, I don't know. Those things have not yet been fleshed out, but we are going to have some wiggle room there, which I think is good because sometimes not being able to appoint a guardian who doesn't have you know certain certifications, I believe could pose a problem. Um, here again, th these are the things that they're supposed to look at the Supreme Court uh, when when providing information and documentation on the cert on the uh, certification requirements, the education, the employment history, federal and state criminal records. Now we're already we've already been uh, submitting criminal background checks uh, with uh, the petitions for the guardians that are, or the proposed guardians. And we have them sign a, a form that says, you know, they consent to being named guardian if the court issues an order. But now it's, it's actually codified and it's in there that says, these are the things that the, the court, Supreme Court is supposed to take into consideration when developing their, their, um, uh, minimum information regarding the certification requirements. And then, of course, there are exams that are, and they, they use specific language, which I found interesting. Certification exam administered by a national nonprofit guardianship certification organization, which leads me to believe that they realize that we already have some of those. And uh, I think they're, they're, they wanted to kind of give you the hint, hint that you may want to seek out the um, the ones that are already you know doing this, uh, but there there are certain uh, organizations that will you can do um, these these certification exams, and it could be that if you have a certain education or a certain license, like I said, a lawyer, a, a social worker, a nursing home administrator. They may say, okay, if you have that license and you you pass the certification exam, then we're gonna we're gonna say you can be a guardian uh, of more than uh, two people or three people. Um, <clears throat> so that's the third requirement: mandatory certification. The fourth requirement, new requirement, or additional, more stringent requirement, is review hearings. There have always been review hearings. There's always been language in the order, or at least it was supposed to, that the person who was declared incapacitated could get an attorney and ask the attorney to petition the court to do a review um, at any time. Um, and and, and the, the review hearing was to, for example, if someone felt, hey, I've improved, or someone else felt that the guardian says this person is improved, they no longer need a guardian. They could be requested at, at any time. Now, under the new, the new changes, it goes from that to being automatic. If, if evidence presented at the hearing suggests certain circumstances may change. For example, as I said earlier, the person is in a medically induced coma. And the doctor says, well, we're going to keep them that way, you know, for 30 days or 60 days because we're worried about brain swelling or whatever it might be. The judge may say, OK, we're going to do another hearing at 90 days. Um, and it, it must be scheduled. At, at any event, there must be a review hearing scheduled within a year. It can be earlier, as, as we just discussed, if there's some reason to suggest that capacity may change, um, and it, it could be automatic if, if someone requests it. Um, but if there's something in there that, that gives any indication that the circumstances may change, you know, if the person had a stroke and is unconscious, but they expect them to re recuperate or recover, uh, there could be a lot of reasons. Uh, but so... The court can, can at the time the, uh, the guardian is established or guardianship is established, they can schedule that review hearing in advance 
at some point, but at the very, very outside in any event, must be must be scheduled for a year out. Um, during the mandatory review hearing, the person must be present with counsel. Now, there's always been an exception, and some judges don't like to um, grant the exception. But if the doctor says, or what in the expert report, they think it could be harmful. I mean, as we all know, there's a lot of dementia at residents or Alzheimer's uh, patients who it's it's very agitating to take them out of their uh, known environment. So there have been a lot of times where the doctors have said, look, I don't think they should attend the hearing. So we have had people participate via Zoom or Teams or other platforms using, you know, some kind of a tablet or an iPad. So, you know, the, the question now is going to be, you know, do they have to come in person? Uh, how does that change the, the fact that they were supposed to be there to begin with? You, you know, I, I never like to see us drag some elderly confused person into court. Sometimes it's just, it's terrible. I, I It's just, it's, it's tough to watch. Um, some residents, you know, they come and they just kind of sit there. But others, you can tell it's really... They want to talk, but they can't get their thoughts straight. They can't they can't get out what they want to say. I mean, there are times where I just felt very, very terribly bad for some of the folks that have been forced to attend some of these hearings. So with some of these new rules, the question is going to be, what's that going to mean? You know, the, must be present with counsel. Is there a lawyer there? Can they be present on, on, on via Zoom? Can the lawyer with them be present via Zoom? Um, the court can consider the, the evidence any time um, that, it, that the person's condition could improve, including um, is, there, is there a likelihood that, that the resident's incapacity could be managed by medication? You know, I'm sure many of you have seen when you get a resident in your facility and they're confused and not doing well, you get them on a medication reg regimen where they're taking the right medication, they're taking it on a schedule when they're supposed to take it at the proper dose, and they're eating meals as they're supposed to and getting proper um, <clears throat> nutrition. It's amazing what can happen in three to six months with certain people when they've been living at home and, and eating or not eating and not taking their medication and not listening. Um, so, you know, whether whether medications or rehab or other means could could make a difference, you know, the court may say, okay, well, we're going to then give it six months and we'll come back. You know, whether whether they the, the potential exists to regain physical or cognitive ability, and we've talked about some of those things. Um, you know, whether whether they're whether there's a, a good chance that they're going to get better, and a lot of times, you know, let's face it, we just don't know. But people can make a, an, an educated guess or an educated medical opinion, and the court has to take that into consideration. Uh, the opinion of medical professionals, people who have examined the incapacitated person. When we, before we start, it's called alleged incapacitated person. Once a decree is ordered, then, then the person is an incapacitated person. So you have to look at these things. They have to look at this evidence that whether they could adequately be managed by medication or other means, whether potential exists to regain uh, physical or mental cognition, opinion of the medical professionals who examine, you know, did we have somebody who was their family doctor for 30 years or 20 years who is now no longer their doctor because we have an attending physician? Maybe you bring that doctor in and you let them testify uh, to the court about what they've seen over the, the person over the years and why, you know, this this uh, decline might be temporary. Circumstances about the, the daily living. And that's where I think nursing homes may have a little bit of a leg up here with some of these issues because, <clears throat> excuse me, when you have somebody living at home or in an apartment or even in personal care, they're not going to have the structure or the, or the, the, the eyes on them that you're going to have in a nursing home. So a lot of times, you know, I think 
um, you know, it's it's going to be pretty clear um, if if somebody's in a nursing home and they're bed bound, uh, as opposed to being able to live at home, uh, whether they really are really incapacitated and, and not able to function uh, on their own and are in fact incapacitated. And in my view, it's most of the time it's pretty clear. I mean, there are times where it's it's not, and that's that's what this is um, put in place to address. But there are times when uh, when when it's not, and and it's it's kind of well, you know, that the person sometimes is lucid, sometimes they're not. How often are they lucid? How often are they not? What kind of support system do they have? You know. But the, the sad cases are the ones where they're just not lucid at all and they got nobody. And, I, and, and I've dealt with those situations and it's sad, but it's reality. Um, but the court must discharge the, the guardianship if it finds it necessary that it doesn't, uh, it finds that the guardianship is no longer necessary or there are now less restrictive alternatives that exist. And basically, you know, that's kind of always been the case, but now it's it's in the statute. It's codified. So we now go from saying a lot of these things were already there uh, in the statute and were already things that we we knew and that we did, but they're now specifically mandated in the new uh, Act 61 of 2023 mandatory legal representation of the alleged incapacitated, greater, greater emphasis on exploring less restrictive measures, mandatory certification of the guardians, and the review hearings. So those are the biggies. Those are the four biggies uh, in terms of Act 61. Now, what does it mean? New complexities. <clears throat> We've talked a lot about that. Additional safeguards to individual rights, which was the main, the main purpose. You know, that's kind of, um, you know, what what this was meant to do. Uh, as always, I think maybe there are some areas where maybe they they did a little more than they probably needed to, which could create some issues, uh, like now increasing costs and having more witnesses involved. But there's going to be closer scru scrutiny and. The one thing that it's going to do is it's going to require every all the courts to look a little closer, <clears throat> making sure that they're they're safeguarding individuals' rights. But it's going to have underscore the importance of having involvement of experienced legal counsel as well, because we're now going to have these these nuances that we're going to have to um, navigate, and not just on the person that <clears throat> is appointed. A, uh, a lawyer who's the alleged incapacitated, but the, the counsel who's filing the petition, somebody like me who goes in on behalf of organizations and facilities and life care facilities and files the petition and pursues the guardianship. Um, you know, there have been some allegations that, you know, well, you have lawyers who are just doing this as a moneymaker. You know, they just go and file file guardianship petitions because you know they can they can charge a fee. I I I, I imagine that probably is true. I I've certainly never done that. Um, as I said, you know when I do it, it's because I have a client calls me and and the doctor you know pretty clearly fills out a report that says yeah this is needed. But um, you know we we need to make sure if you don't have somebody who knows what they're doing. You're, it's going to cause delays, and it's going to increase your costs, and you you may end up not getting your guardian in a situation where otherwise you ought to. Um, pra practical experience benefits and caveats. Once it's in place, you know it may it may be hard to take away, especially for nursing homes. It's likely there will often be less restrictive options. The question is. Are those options uh, preferable? Are they reasonable? Are they practical? Are they available? And just because there's a less restrictive option does not mean it's the best option. So we may have situations where we're advocating and saying, yes, judge, there may be a less restrictive option here, 
but it's not the best option. The best option, you know, especially now with the certified guardians and the review hearings, um, you know, the, the guardian is still preferable. Now, MA pays for the guardian. If somebody's on MA and a guardian's appointed, you can bill $300 a month back to the state. But who will pay for power of attorney? As far as I know, there's no mechanism in place. So if the resident's an MA resident, are they going to pay that? I mean, the $45 a month isn't going to pay for it. Is the facility going to pay it? Is the family going to have to pay it? Um, and then you have to be sure that the, the, the physician or the psych evaluation clearly states that the that the best option is guardianship, that they do not see a, a less restrictive option, that they don't believe that the person who has who you're going in for guardianship for has the mental status to properly execute a power of attorney. Potential benefits of guardianship, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because you know it a lot of it uh is is kind of self-explanatory but you know if, if you've got these issues and you have no one looking out for this resident that you know you you end up with quite a lot of questions but here if you have a guardian you know uh advocate for their care you know, you keep somebody to attend or be available for the care plan conferences. If there's somebody who you think might be might there might be an abusive situation, you can you can uh, have them assist in in the Medicaid reimbursement and and getting their assets together to pay their bills, speeding up the reimbursement process, getting MA approved in a month or two rather than six or seven months. And then the, the resident has a proper caretaker who can be guided by the best interests, can act quickly, helps mitigate, you know, any issues, and is an advocate uh, for their rights, especially in instances where we've probably already seen, all, all seen, where we either know or suspect that they've been taken advantage of or exploited. Perspective, perspective of a professional guardian. I had a conversation, I thought it would be interesting, with Missy Wise, um, she is uh, with Keystone Guardian Services in Elizabethville. Um, she does a lot of guardians. I know Guardian Services of PA is up in that area too. And there are two organizations. Keystone is, is one. There's another one that's in Harrisburg. Um, I forget the name of it uh, off the top of my head. But there are certain ones that, that, that are, you know, fairly, fairly involved. And I, I talked to her and I said, look, I, I'm sure you have some concerns. And she said, well, I do, absolutely. I'm, I'm concerned about, you know, we have to attend these hearings. We have to attend review hearings. We have to attend sometimes more than one hearing to pursue the guardianship. Well, they had a situation, she told me, where they were in court for almost a whole day. Yeah, they're going to get $300 a month, $3,600 a year, to be guardian for this resident, but they spent $4,000 in legal fees uh, for some particular issue. So before they ever even got the guardianship, they were in the hole. Um, what I talked about earlier, uh, concerns about guardian availability. What's this certification requirement gonna do? Is everybody gonna need to be certified? Only some people? Um, what are the rules gonna be once they're finalized? Which attorneys will be able to legitimately provide representation? I mean, it talks about uh, uh, competent counsel. Who's, you know, there are a lot of attorneys that I've dealt with, unfortunately, who just are not all that up on a lot of the requirements. And they come in representing a family member, and the family member wants to be guardian, and their heart's in the right place. But they or, their, or the attorney really don't have any idea what it means uh, to be appointed guardian. There are things that you have to do. You're expected to visit. You're expected to handle financials. There are reports that you have to file. Um, so there are a lot of times, you know, people, th this process is going to require, you know, that the, the people are a little, a little more um, educated on what true requirements are of guardianships. And of course, the concerns about the ability of the family. You know, if there's a family member who just does not agree 
that uh, somebody else should be guardian of their family member, um, you know, they can they can ask for review hearings. Um, now it's new. We're only we're only less than two months into this thing, but I'm already hearing stories about people constantly. And then the court has even had to step in and, and limit certain people's uh, ability to request review hearings because some people have started to even try to abuse the process. So, you know, as with anything else, the more leeway and rights you give people, uh, the more potential chances there are for certain people who don't have maybe somebody's best interest in mind to take advantage of the process. So, so that's, that's another concern. And then also, you know, the appointed counsel in the GAL, the guardian ad litem, and we talked about that before earlier in the presentation, you know, the appointing counsel being there to advocate and the guardian ad litem looking at the best interest. So, you know, who, who are you going to, who are they going to deal with? Who, who's the court going to listen to, you know, and the guardian, are they going to be put in the middle? You've got here, you've got the resident and you, then you've got the resident appointing counsel. And over here, you've got the guardian ad litem. And then on the other side, you've got somebody like me who's there representing the interests of the facility and the guardians trying to, you know, do the right thing. And and, and they're, they're going to be appointed to take care of and watch, you know, be be guardian for this person. And sometimes it can be a little bit of a, you know, a whirlwind when you're trying to go through the process. So I thank Missy very much for her uh, for input. But these are things that I thought it was important because with it being new to get perspective of someone, not just from me, who's a lawyer and a former nursing home administrator, but somebody who's actually gonna be doing the legwork, the nuts and bolts of, of, of this stuff on an ongoing basis. Um, family involvement or lack thereof, uh, we talk about due diligence. Uh, do we have any, Do we have, uh, Kim, do we have any questions so far? We have not had any questions come through yet. As a general reminder, if everyone, if you do have a question, use the chat icon at the yeah. bottom of your screen to submit any questions. I just wanted to make sure I left time because I see we only have about eight minutes left. You're so good. I, I didn't want to go right at the edge if we had if we had uh, questions. Anyhow, the court is always going to look, you know, at at a family member being involved if 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 it's appropriate. Uh, as opposed to, um, you know, someone who is just a hired outside guardian. The guardians are often very good, but if you have someone who's a daughter or a sister or a family member, you know, the courts are all, all always going to probably look at that as being, you know, probably preferential, as long as the person has the ability. I mean, I've had family members who are confused themselves who want to be somebody's guardian, and it's just clear uh, that they shouldn't be. I had a, a resident who who had a family member who was out in like Nevada in the military or something who was calling into the court and challenging the fact that we were trying to appoint a, a, a local guardian for, for a resident. And the judge was like, how are you going to be, you know, overseeing someone, you know, from 2,000 miles away with a two-hour time difference? It, it, like, it, you just have to look at practicality. Again, we talked about notice has to be given. Uh, contact information will have to be required for family members next of kin so that they're they're aware of it. Well, many times, in fact, I'd say the majority of the time, the family members do not participate. They don't show up. Once in a while, I'll get a phone call just asking me, what is this? A couple of questions. Sometimes the family members get involved and they say, oh, well, wait a minute, you know, why didn't anybody ask me to be guardian? And the facility tells me, well, because we haven't seen them in a year and a half, and all of a sudden when they get notice, they want to be involved, which is fine. I'm not saying it's not, but you have to, you have to give people uh, next of kin and family members notice. And so the court's going to want to know what the interactions are with the family. Uh, why is the family a viable option? Why are they not a viable option? I mean, if you have a family member who the resident has has told people at the facility that they're they've been mean to them in the past. You know, I had a lady who, when I was an administrator, told me that her son used to come to her trailer, put his gun on the table, give put a checkbook in front of her, and make her sign 
checks to him. Now, I think we would all agree that type of person is probably not a viable option as a guardian. And of course, we had to you know, report that, uh, even though it was no longer an issue because she was now in our facility. But there are times where, let's face it, it's just not going to be the best option. Sometimes it will be. Sometimes it won't. Um, so we have to do research. You know, a lot of times when people come to you, I know in facilities, you get minimal information, especially if they're admitted in the middle of the night or admitted on, you know, seven o'clock on a Saturday evening. But, you know, we have to look. Do we, is there a POA? Uh, if there is, why have they been effect, ineffective? Is the person who's the POA just not doing their job as a POA? Are there pulse? Are there other health care directives? So you're going to have to make sure now we can't, you know, there are times where, you know, I have had people come out of the woodwork after the fact when we filed a petition and they call and say, well, I'm power of attorney. Well, the facility never even knew it because the power of attorney had never gotten in touch with the facility and never given a copy of the power of attorney to anybody. So you're going to have to do some diligence and talk to the resident and any available family members to make sure that you've got some, you know, the best that you can, a minimal amount of information on this person. Um, while the court ultimately appoints the guardian, many are, many are uncontested. In fact, most of the ones that I've done have been uncontested. Makes it, makes it much easier when there's nobody else there saying, hey, I wanna be involved because then the guardian is like it. But um, starting in 2019, that was the last time that there were, there were changes to the laws. I just wanted to put these in here that you can see, you know, they wanted to say, how, how many people are you uh, being guardian for? What's your experience? What's your training? Making sure we have criminal background checks on the people that are being submitted as proposed guardians. Do they have insurance? Do they have theft insurance? Do they have dis dishonesty insurance? Do they have conflicts? Have they had any disciplinary problems? What's the amount of the communication that they, they typically do? Do they come in monthly? Do they come in every other month, quarterly? Uh, I think that makes a difference. I'm sure you would all agree. How hard is it for you to get in touch with them when you've got something you need to do with uh, a Medicaid application or a serious health issue? So we had... We had the original law, then we had the 2019 changes, and now we have the four major new changes under Act 61. So what if the guardian, what if you have somebody who comes in and a guardian is the problem? I've had that happen, where we have a family member who's just not doing the job, not filing their reports, not responsive, not helping to, to get financial information together. We can do uh, a review, that's where the review hearing that we talked about that may be problematic in some issues, in instances would certainly be very much welcomed to go in and say, hey, judge, we have a guardian here. This guardian is not acting in the best interest of this person. We need to make a change. And so, you know, if that it happens, we, we, have, we have options. Um, the guardians can work with uh, the facility on compliance issues, care issues, Medicare, Medicaid, disposition of property? Uh, is there a trailer? Is there a house? Is there, are there rental properties? Are there uh, retirement accounts? Um, and then the income, you know, oftentimes, you know, it's hard to get the families to cooperate. You get the, the guardian involved and, and that, that revenue every month will, will start coming to the facility instead of going to family members who may be misappropriating. It. Anyway, <clears throat> If you have any questions, uh, you can either hit me up later, sub submit them to Kim. If you ever in need of um, uh, guardianship services as a lawyer, someone to uh, ask questions, or if you know that you are in need of having to petition or uh, assistance in finding someone to help uh, as a guardian and help you through the process, this is something I've done a lot of. I like doing it. And I would be very, very uh, glad to hear from any of you, especially uh, even if it's just a question, uh, I'm, I'm always here to help. So I hope you found this uh, 
worthwhile. I hope it's been informative and uh, I hope you look at it as an hour that was well spent. And with thanks that- Thanks so much, Mike. I appreciate I'm, your time today and thanks to everyone for joining us. Okay, that's it. We're done? That's it. Okay, everybody. Have a nice day. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Bye.